have to really escalate the noise we make so that we'll be heard. USA, your weekly hour of LGBTQ news. I'm Andy Hum. I'm Ann Northrup. And uh, today uh, we're going to start the show with a couple of guests. Um, as Republican led legislatures across the country are accelerating anti transgender and other anti LGBTQ uh, bills and laws legislation, our guests are. Nadine Smith, the executive director of Equality Florida, where they're having a titanic fight, and Shannon Minter, the legal director of the National Center for Lesbian Rights, and we're gonna talk about how to fight back. We'll also remember fondly, I think, uh, the late Vice President Walter Fritz Mondale and his activity on gay rights issues. Uh, a gay student in Clyde, Texas, won a battle for gender nonconformity in his school. And neighbors in small town Wisconsin and Australia are standing up to homophobia. We have some updates on men behaving badly. Scott Rudin, Andrew Cuomo, and Jerry Falwell Jr. Of course, I'm tempted to ask whether those are actual headlines. Uh, there is a vicious crackdown on LGBTQ people in Cameroon. But Peru elected its first out lesbian member of their Congress. And Gus Kenworthy, Olympic uh, skier, is acting as Colton Underwoods, the, uh, the virgin bachelor, his gay guide in a controversial new Netflix series. But now we welcome our guests. Uh, do we have our guests? Yeah, they're coming in. We should uh, go ahead. Start to introduce. Uh, uh, jo thank you. Joining us now are Nadine Smith, a longtime executive director of Equality Florida, which is that state's largest uh, organization dedicated to ending discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity, an award-winning journalist who turned into an organizer and um, was, uh, well, such a history, including be being one of the four co-chairs of the National March on Washington in 1993. We could go on. Um, uh, also joining us is Shannon Minter, who was the legal director of the National Center for Lesbian Rights. You may remember him as the counsel for same-sex couples in the landmark California same-sex marriage case that won the right of same-sex couples to marry and, uh, and the, uh, the lead attorney in Christian Legal Society versus Martinez, which was a Supreme Court decision that upheld the right of student groups uh, who uh, prohibited discrimination on the basis of uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, we hope that holds up. And one's California Lawyer of the Year, but let's get into what's going on right now. Uh, and you two are the best people to talk about it. But let's start off, Anne, let's start off a little well, bit. Bo both of you are just uh, two of the most fundamentally important activists, lawyers, uh, workers on these issues for decades. Uh, but the headline in the news this week, of course, is the conviction of Derek Chauvin in Minneapolis for the murder of George Floyd uh, last year. And this has such wide implications for policing, for uh, uh, civil rights across the board. So I want to get some reaction from each of you on your immediate feelings about this conviction and how this uh, implicates all of us. Uh, Nadine, why don't we start with you? Well, you know, when word came that the uh, verdict was imminent, I gathered with uh, a, a group of uh, pastors and, and community organizers in downtown St. Petersburg, and we literally huddled around a cell phone waiting to hear. And I remember that feeling of, of just holding our breath because the outcome was not assured. Even though we had watched this murderer murder a man in front of us and it was captured on, tele, uh, on video camera, there was no certainty in any of us that the words guilty would be uttered. And so, you know, I was, we were all hit with, with a, a wave of relief that there was finally a level of accountability 
but also horror that it was ever in doubt that we continue to, to be in a system where accountability for police disproportionately snatching the lives of black and brown people, uh, you know, th that it's a rare thing. And that, and that it is so instilled in the fabric of policing that not only did he kneel on George Floyd's neck until he was dead, despite his pleas for his life, despite onlookers pleading for his life, but that all the other police officers in the vicinity did absolutely nothing to help, even though they knew they were being filmed and they were surrounded by witnesses because that culture of impunity runs so deep. And so it is a good thing that Derek Chauvin was held accountable, uh, but it is in no way evidence that the system is still not fundamentally broken. And it is the, you know, that is the, that is the lowest bar and so now, you know, if I'm if I'm perfectly honest, you know, the, the part of me that feels relief that we did not wake up to the news of yet another uh, police officer walking without any consequence. But I still hold a great deal of anxiety about what the what the um, sentence will be, and whether um, a door has opened for an appeal that will be successful when they feel as though they are out of the the biggest glare of light. Yeah, it didn't appear that the judge was uh, entirely on board with this when he said that he thought uh, Maxine Waters' comments might have opened the door to an appeal. Uh, Shannon, what was your uh, feeling about this? Well, as Nadine said, you know, after the enormous relief comes an even greater sadness um, about the horrific circumstances of uh, George Floyd's murder and the recognition that we have such a long way to go to even begin to address just the pervasiveness of the, as Nadine put it I, I think that's perfect the culture of impunity that has sheltered police violence and brutality towards black and brown people towards lgbtq people for such a long time but i am encouraged i i want to believe and i'm going to choose to believe that this can be a significant moment in a in a kind of a turning point if we will continue to try to keep this 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 ember this spark of of hopefulness um alive i'll say something encouraging because this week also you mentioned uh, nadine the other police did nothing and they're still up on charges but this week, uh, a former, uh, a fired police officer in Buffalo, uh, Cariol Horn, who had intervened when police were choking a man and took their arms off the uh, suspect, was fired for that. And now she's gotten back pay, settlement, restitution, uh, damages, all that uh, in, in the state of New York. So that's encouraging. And Andy, that makes me want to say something else. Like, yes, and one of the one of the, I think most encouraging things about the Chauvin trial was that other police officers did step up and testify against Chauvin. I mean, that is that is new, and that is breaking you know the the blue wall of, of silence and complicity. And that I mean, that is very significant. And this is a footnote to the case, and I want to ask you, I, I guess, Shannon, as an attorney, uh, when the judge was making the uh, uh, reading, you know, what you had to do in the jury, uh, the judge included, you can't uh, express any prejudice based on sexual orientation or gender identity. Has this just become sort of a standard thing in courtrooms or just Minnesota? Or was it just this judge? What, what gives? No, that is actually pretty standard now. And, you know, that's very significant and important. Yeah, there's been so much work done to include prohibitions against expressions of bias against LGBTQ people, along with uh, other protected characteristics in um, both state and federal uh, jury instructions. So that that actually is also, you know, that was a, a, a small moment, but an, a, a, an important one, a good one. Uh, I want to get to uh, the legislation across the country that we're here primarily to discuss, but I want to make one more point about this, which is that what gives me hope is the public fighting back. I remain extremely discouraged by the attitudes 
of police, uh, a great civil rights lawyer here who I know was at a police department event recently where they were supposedly talking about constitutional rights and, and progress, but it was one police officer or official lecturing the troops about how demonstrators are the enemy. And I find that over the years I've been doing this to be so much the, the default position of the police. We are the enemy and they're always out to get us as the people who are undermining the rule of law or civil society. And what gives me hope is all those people standing around while watching what was happening to George Floyd and objecting and wanting to intervene and videotaping it and and calling uh, for help and calling for EMPs. And, and if we are increasing the ability of the public to fight back and speak up, uh, I think that's an encouraging uh, sign. Darnell Frazier, who, sh who did the videotaping and held that camera on this incident for all that time, was absolutely fearless, deserves the Nobel Peace Prize, and deserves us to follow her example. And uh, Keith Ellison, who assembled a dream team to uh, prosecute this case. He was the first uh, Muslim American member of Congress. So there's that. This leads into what Ann was talking about in terms of protests. We are going to talk about all these anti-transgender bills and LGBT bills. But in Florida, uh, uh, Nadine, you've just passed this bill uh, to essentially, uh, you know, criminalize protests. How are you going to deal with that? Well, I'm glad you frame it that way because it, it is absolutely uh, introduced as a reaction to the peaceful protests that broke out across the country in the, in the uh, wake of George Floyd's murder and subsequent murders. And, um, you know, and the research is very clear, overwhelmingly, 93% of these protests have occurred without violence and where the violence happens was generally because of opposition coming to provoke violence. Uh, this, this legislation was intended to uh, create a tool to intimidate and to um, stop those protests. And without them, uh, the, the other thing research shows is that those protests were, were not only a part of creating an atmosphere of accountability, but there are, are changes that have happened. Police departments, uh, you know, adopting policies, uh, body cams, hiring uh, social workers to, um, you know, to take on parts of this job where a person with a gun on their hip is not net needed. Um, and some, you know, rethinking about what the idea of public safety really is. And so it is really disheartening to see some, you know, legislators who, you know, who, who want to sort of applaud this ruling by the, uh, the court finding him guilty by this jury at the same time, they have voted to dismantle the, the peaceful mechanism in, in which uh, the atmosphere where the accountability could even occur. So um, I think that we're, you know, there's a sense that people are not going to be uh, cowed by this. They're going to still, we're going to still take the streets. You know, we had a, a public gathering in the, um, in anticipation of the verdict yesterday. And uh, no doubt this will end up in the courts because it's definitely a First Amendment infringement and um, no matter what spin they try to make post January 6th, the genesis of this, the impetus for it, and the reason for it was to push back against people protesting violence against black and brown people by police. Well, you talk about the uh, hypocrisy or, or maybe just the stealth tactics of these legislators who speak out of both sides of their mouths. I was fascinated to see a recent poll that says that more than half of the United States population says they actually know trans people in person, uh, young people more than older people, but more than half the whole population, and less than 30% of the population supports these anti-trans bills that we're seeing. No medical care, no sports, no education in the schools, uh, and yet legislators, minus a, a small victory you've just had, Nadine, on sports. Uh, these legislators are just uh, putting forth a tsunami of bad legislation. How, why, uh, what's going on here? Well, it's driven by politics and it's driven by the same um, 
impulse to restrict access to the ballot box because they are playing to an increasingly narrow slice of the electorate. Uh, as you said, two thirds of Americans think this raft, raft of anti-trans bills are terrible. They, you know, just really don't think they should become law. But among that third is the is the slice of the electorate that Republicans are pandering to. And so we've seen this introduced in what, 30 states now, not because of any incident that has occurred. Even the, the you know, the sponsors here in Florida, you know, will admit there's been no problem. The guidance, the guidelines that exist at the you know school level, the collegiate level, the Olympic level, the professional level. There's no problem that they're addressing, but you know, a, a right-wing think tank at the national level said, here's a way to scoop up some, some hardcore uh, right-wing primary votes and um, show your fealty to Trumpism. And so that's the only thing animating these, and they don't care whatsoever the harm that it inflicts, particularly on, on young you know, trans students who you know, just have to you know, face such headwinds just to exist. That's the, the bad news. That's where this, that's the only reason for these uh, laws to, to uh, you know, be, in, be introduced as part of the culture war. The good news has been the incredible pushback. You know, the Miami Heat uh, came out against this. The NCAA issued multiple statements. Some of the researchers that they were citing as justification wrote letters to the legislature saying, this ain't it. And, and don't twist my words to try to, to justify what you're doing. So we have seen public opinion move uh, dramatically in, in our direction. And, and I think the culmination of that uh, was, you know, just this week. <laughs> Time is so distorted. I guess that was just yesterday. Um, uh, no, they, 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 yeah, yesterday when, um, when the Senate, the House had already passed it and the Senate uh, in the Rules Committee uh, temporarily postponed, basically tabled uh, the issue and the sponsor said it's unlikely to be taken up. And we're going to remain vigilant because legislative session is full of shenanigans, but it is definitely uh, a huge, huge uh, development that even the sponsor is saying they think they are out of time to, to pass this. And part of that reason is because of the overwhelming opposition. And I just want to shout out to the LGBT Democrats and the, um, you know, the Black Caucus and the Democratic Party here in Florida who fought this tooth and nail, brought up a, a wall of amendments to expose the hypocrisy and really made it clear that they weren't going to slip this thing through without a fight. So, so Shannon's many of these bills have passed at this point, Arkansas, Tennessee, Idaho. How are the legal challenges to these anti-transgender bills faring? Well, uh, look, this is new. So there haven't been a lot of legal challenges yet. We've only had one state last year, Idaho passed a law uh, banning entirely trans girls and young women from all school-based sports. That bill is identical in substance and effect to bills that are being proposed and unfortunately passed uh, across the country. That was an interesting, um, that was interesting what happened with, with Idaho. It was challenged immediately. The ACLU brought a case challenging it. It was heard by a very, the case was heard by a very conservative judge, probably one of the most conservative judges in the country. He'd been appointed to the bench by President Trump. And I'm not going to kid you, when I saw who the case had been assigned to, I was very concerned about what might happen. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you what, this, this judge, he's conservative, but he's smart. And he listened to, after listening to all of the evidence, enjoined, uh, issued a preliminary injunction, stopping the law from going into effect and saying, look, I've looked at all the evidence here and there is just nothing that would support this kind of sweeping categorical exclusion of all of these girls, trans girls from playing school sports. Uh, so that, that was very encouraging. Now that case is up on appeal right now to the Ninth Circuit. There's going to be an oral argument in the case on May 3rd, but uh, that I am encouraged in light of that very powerful decision, very clear decision by a very conservative judge that we will have uh, some success in challenging these other state bans. That said, I cannot stress this enough, though. Like, we really cannot uh get into this mentality as a movement where we think the courts are going to save us from this onslaught of terrible bills no 
we may get, I, I expect that we will. I hope that we will. Believe me, the litigation groups will do everything we can to get some, some victories, you know, hopefully striking down all or some or most of these uh, bad bills. Um, but we, what's, what's going to make the difference is the kind of engagement and mobilization that Nadine was talking about. And I could not agree more. The silver lining of all this is that, what, two years ago, the, the number of people who were even thinking about trans kids in sports or even thinking about the medical care that trans kids needs was minuscule. And now we've got the whole country talking about it. And we know what happens. We know what happens when the other side injects an issue into the mainstream, trying to take advantage of an information gap. It hurts like hell initially, and that's where we are right now. And it's very painful, and these kids are suffering. But in the long run, it gives us an unprecedented opportunity to reach the public and to change hearts and minds. And we're already seeing that reflected in the polling numbers, as Nadine just pointed out. But, and you're right. Everyone is talking about it, including the president of the United States. Uh, and as Nadine says, uh, major pro uh, sports stars and everyone across the board. Now, uh, HRC uh, published this full page ad in the New York Times asking corporations to stand up and do more. But the one thing they didn't do was ask corporations to stop funding politicians, which is what a number of us have been uh, begging them to do as, as a real uh, way to hold uh, politicians accountable. Uh, you know, uh, there's the whole Mitch McConnell, corporations should stay out of politics except to, you know, just keep giving us money. Uh, Nadine, do you think uh, uh, corporations have got to play tougher in, uh, in withholding funds from these people? Well, I mean, to be clear, you know, companies, business, the business community has always had a role to play, you know, whether it's in apartheid South Africa, finally, you know, calling on the government to end, end the uh, uh, the boycotts. You know, the same was true in, you know, the Birmingham bus boycotts. The, it was the businesses taking on the sort of intractable political class to say something's got to give. So, so there is a history of business stepping into that because when, when it comes down to their analysis that it's going to cost more to maintain the status quo than to change. And so I do think that there are companies, you know, whether it's Nike uh, making Colin Kaepernick, you know, one of the, one of the uh, you know, symbols of their company, um, it, there's a recognition that you, the status quo will not hold and, and where you stand uh, matters. Uh, both, you know, ethically, morally, but also in terms of your bottom line. And when you, you look at, you know, just where the GDP of the country is, where it's concentrated, it's concentrated in, in the places that are more progressive, more forward uh, looking and have, you know, more, more cash, bottom line. So I think businesses will increasingly feel the pressure um, to not stay on the sidelines and to do more than, than symbolic gestures. We saw it in the aftermath of January 6, where a whole uh, you know list of companies pledged that they would not give a dime to any of the uh, Republicans who voted against certifying the presidential election. That many of them made a very big public you know show of of taking that important stand. But in the shadows, we we find that they have found other ways to to sneak money into the pockets of. Republican legislators. So I think it's two parts. One, yes, we should expect uh, companies, especially those that want to march with us at Pride or throw up their Black Lives Matter, um, you know, uh, avatars on social media to actually walk the talk and, and be consistent. And as consumers, we have an obligation to, to put our money where our values are. We have two programs, and one of them is called Open Doors Florida. Uh, precisely because we want our people to know who's standing with us, who's standing up for equality, you know, and given a choice, spend your money at the restaurant that has taken that public stand and, you know, is walking the talk. Buy your shoes, get your hair cut, you know. And I think we've got to be thinking that way uh, because we, you know, there's a lot of ways to vote at the ballot box and they, they contest that in every way they can and vote to, they work to suppress it. But we also vote when we spend our dollars and we, we ought to leverage that uh, for maximum impact 
every social justice movement has leveraged the power of the dollar and, and boycotts uh, to make change, and we should be no different. And let them know we're doing it and why we're doing it. Oh, and sure. Shannon, Shannon, you're originally from Texas. Uh, is there any hope for Texas? What's going on? This is it's so depressing. Oh yeah, there, there's there's a lot of a lot of room for hope here. I mean, talking to you from Texas right now. Uh, yes, I mean, obviously, as the whole country painfully knows, uh, the Texas has a really conservative. Uh, state legislature that does the, that's the bad news and a very conservative governor and Texas is considering I think more anti trans bills than any other state in the country right now by last count there were more than 30 uh, and specifically anti trans pieces of legislation that have been introduced in the Texas legislature uh, if we get by with none of them being passed, it will it will be a miracle. I'll say that it's just such a toxic, just reactionary environment in the state legislature right now. The good news is that really does not reflect the people of this state. Uh, you know, the right wing has kind of a, a lock hold through long you know history of gerrymandering and other kind of dirty pool tactics on the legislature. There are, you know, active efforts ongoing to, to mitigate that situation as much as we can. But I mean, if you were to, I guarantee you, if you were to take just a poll of, of people in this state, the majority would absolutely not support uh, targeting transgender kids and would not support many of the like really um, extreme pieces of legislation that are being proposed right now. So, you know, that's the dilemma that, that we have here. But yeah, there's there's a lot of room for hope. There's a lot of organizing going on here. There's lots of uh, new LGBT grassroots groups that have sprung up across the state. And uh, Quality Texas is, is really strong and a really effective uh, state advocacy organization. So absolutely, there's plenty of room for, for hope. But of course, the, you know, the Equality Act, the federal LGBTQ rights bill, would override all this, cover all the states. The uh, vast majority of the American people support it. It passed the House. Um, uh, but of course, it's blocked by the Republican minority in the Senate and absent getting rid of the filibuster is li is likely not to see the light of day. In the oh, actually, you know, Schumer has promised to vote on it, but it'll be a cloture vote where they will find out that the Republicans aren't blocking it uh, through cloture. So, I mean, I, I, again, we want to pass legislation. But Shannon, we did get the Bostock decision which said that uh, in, in employment, uh, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, and gender identity is sex discrimination. How is that being used in all in fighting all these other bad pieces of legislation? Well, sure. I mean, Bostock is going to be one of our, um, you know, major uh, arguments in cases challenging the bills that pass. It played a very important role in the uh, striking down the Idaho sports ban. Uh, it is central to many of the cases that we're bringing in healthcare, education, definitely employment, of course. The decision itself was about employment, housing. I mean, Bostock was a huge ga game changer. And as a result of that decision, you know, we can now say that LGBTQ people have nationwide anti-discrimination protections in some very key areas, the ones I just said, that are like main things that affect people's everyday life, health care, housing, employment, and schools. Uh, you know, we don't have any federal public accommodations protections because there is no federal sex discrimination law, and we don't have any protections against discrimination in federally funded programs because, again, there's no federal law that prohibits sex discrimination in that arena. The Equality Act would uh, fill those two very important gaps. I mean, and just as important, I think the you know the Equality Act would really would make it uh, unmistakably clear that we have protections, nationwide protections that are express, explicit, and secure. And I think would really change the kind of uh, 
national environment in a way that would be very beneficial uh, to people like me who live in red states where, yes, theoretically, uh, we do have the protections of not just theoretically, but actually we have the protections provided by Bostock. But that message really has not permeated to um, many of many people living in this state. Uh, I think probably if you ask most people in the state, they have no idea <laughs> about the Bostock decision or that LGBTQ people have federal anti-discrimination protection. So we, we definitely do, we, you know, we need express federal protections and people living in red states particularly need them. That said, um, n no federal law is going to be a shortcut for changing the culture where we all live. Like the organizing on the ground, the work that state equality groups are doing, in my opinion, is the most important work happening in our movement. I bet Nadine would agree with that. <laughs> well, shout out to Equality Texas. You're right. They're doing phenomenal work. And, and you know, one of the things that Stacey Abrams said is the South isn't red, it's suppressed. And it's true. You know, voter suppression in Florida is done right in the open. You know, the, the um, lingering structures in the aftermath of emancipation, you know, felon disenfranchisement, was voted down by overwhelmingly by Floridians. More than 60% as required by our law. And yet the, the Florida Republican legislature undermined that and, and has continued to, to hold on to that. So the people in our states, the people think of as red states, are, are, we have changed hearts and minds. They are with us on, you know, so our legislatures are much more conservative than our states. And this is why if you are somebody who cares about LGBTQ equality, you have to be pro, you have to be part of this pro-democracy movement. You have to be part of preserving the right for people and expanding the right of people to vote. You have to be part of eliminating all of these these barriers. It is a it's criminal that I can tell by the color of your skin and your zip code how long you have to wait to cast a ballot. And as much as we, you know, we see these heroic stories of people standing in line for seven, eight, nine hours. Um, and, and we see laws now intended to make that impossible, not being able to give people food or water, or, uh, et cetera. It, we shouldn't have to be that heroic to cast our ballots. And so we are, so it, you know, what you see, um, you know, the idea of who we are in these states that are considered red states, who, who the people are who live here. Um, and as good as the uh, Supreme Court was on the Bostock decision on voting rights, they've been terrible, terrible on voting and, rights. and Absolutely. on granting all kinds of religious exemptions for almost everything. This is a great concern, both for the Equality Act, even if we do pass it, that this Supreme Court might say, oh, no, you're treading on religion too much. So that's, but can we talk a little bit about more positive about what's going on at the state level? Yeah, no, I have something very positive to say, and it is Bostock related because our Florida Commission on Human Relations, uh, you know, at the beginning of this year made it crystal clear right. that anywhere you live in the state of Florida, you can file a discrimination complaint based on sexual orientation and gender identity, just like anybody else. And that is, a, a you know, a direct result of both Bostock and the agency that enforces civil rights. Uh, being crystal clear. And we have to, you know, and I think that people have to be able to hold these two understandings. You can file right now if you've experienced discrimination, um, you know, in employment, housing, and public accommodations in Florida because our state civil rights law has all of that in it. It is not a contradiction to say we also need legislation at the federal level that expands the inclusion of the LGBT community in those federal protections. But it's crisp, it, what's so important is that we not lose sight as we talk about the need for these federal for this federal legislation to leave people with the, the impression that they're not currently protected. So number one, we are seeing the, the embrace of Bostock happening at the state level. Number two, we're seeing public opinion galloping in our direction on a range of issues, including uh, trans inclusion. And I think they targeted the trans community precisely because they, they assumed there was not the political infrastructure and the political will to fight back and they were in for a rude awakening and i i point to the fight around marriage equality we lost 38 fights in a row but in doing so 
we we lost forward. We changed the conversation, and we finally stopped talking in antiseptic terms about it and started telling love stories. And now, you know, the the support for marriage equality uh, cuts across every demographic. And I think that that as painful as it is, this is fundamentally what we must do: is education, amplifying the voices of people who don't always get heard. And we changed, we change hearts and minds, which changes votes, which changes who represents us, who changes the legislation that can uh, pass. And, and that is really the work that happens at the local and state level. So uh, I, I definitely agree with, with Shannon. I have dedicated my activist life to doing work at the state level because, you know, when there's gridlock in, ta in, uh, in Washington, D.C., the things that impact our daily lives most directly are happening in our state capitals, our city councils and county commissions. Well, I think that's a hopeful uh, note to end on. We could clearly talk to you not only for the rest of the show, but about three more hours. We will hound both of you to come back soon because it is delicious to talk to you. Uh, but thank you for making time today and uh, giving us a lot to think about. And sign up for our emails. Go to gayusatv.org. And when we send out the email, we will give you links. Uh, some of them have been on your screen to Equality Florida, to the National Center for Lesbian, and right, Lesbian Rights, and how you can get involved. So Shannon Minter, Legal Director, National Center for Lesbian Rights. Nadine Smith, Executive Director, Equality Florida. Fantastic to see you both. And we'll hope to see you both again soon. And thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Andy and Ann. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Whew. Okay. That was a treat. Yes. The two ter just terrific uh, folks that I've admired for years, and we haven't had them on the show before, I don't think. Uh, well, maybe a long time ago, but or maybe I'm just thinking of... Well, we've only been doing, Ann and I have only been doing this together for 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've known both of them for that long, yes, too, and longer. Uh, and it, it, we've it, interviewed it, them many times, I have, as a reporter. And worked with them. So uh, they are wonderful heroes, and they're doing great stuff, and it's just wonderful to uh, pick their brains. So, you know, they... Uh, we, talked we have other news to tell you about. Yes, we talked about the Supreme Court uh, in the course of our conversation, but, uh, you know, so the House did introduce a bill to expand the court to 13. Hasn't been expanded since 1868. And, well, I'm going to have to say don't hold your breath on this. Well, well, Pelosi actually opposes it. I think she thinks it's, uh, but it's, you know. Well, she thinks it's a political mistake that uh, it gives the Republicans ammunition to go out and uh, win more seats because right. the crazy Democrats are trying to pack the court. A piece of good news on an issue we've been working on for years, which is the some somewhat decriminalization of sex work in New York. The dis district attorney, Cy Vance, says they will no longer prosecute sex workers or unlicensed massage how they are dropping 914 open cases and over 5,000 cases in which the charge was for loitering, which that law was uh, for, for the purpose of sex work. That was actually repealed in February, but they are still going to prosecute um, uh, people who patronize sex workers, which, you know. And, well, that's not going to be that's not going to be good for sex workers, because if right. people who patronize them are subject to prosecution, that is going to uh, endanger sex workers. Well, we still have a long way to go. We do. But Cy Vance is beginning to see the light. Uh, we do mourn the death of uh, Fritz Mondale. Uh, I met him once in uh, 1984, just before the Democratic Convention, when I produced an interview that Diane Sawyer did with him at his uh, his home in the woods, asking him who he was going to nominate for vice president. All he would say was not Jesse Jackson. <laughs> I was a Jackson delegate that year. I know. Uh, he, he, well, uh, my story is earlier in 1974, he was running for president and he dropped out, you know, and Jimmy Carter was nominated and took him as his vice president. But he came to the university. 76 was when uh, Carter ran. 1974, when he's campaigning, all right? He's campaigning, comes to University of Virginia because he's running a presidential campaign. And uh, I was the new president of the Gay Student Union, very nervous. I stood up at a forum and asked him a slew of gay rights questions, and he was not ready for them. And he kind of tried to make light of it. Well, maybe, <laughs> you know, he was not prepared. I got a note under my door saying, 
you're embarrassing us. Stop asking these questions at forums. But the picture we had up there was 1982. He was the first keynote speaker when the at the first human rights campaign fund dinner. And uh, there he was trying to, you know, ingratiate himself with the community. He wouldn't say the words gay or lesbian, but he did say he wanted an end to discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. And that was quite a breakthrough. And it was front page news in the uh, New York Times. And that was when Reagan was president and he was going to run against him in uh, 84. And he spent a lot of the speech blasting Reagan for uh, being too conservative. Uh, right. And he was a nice guy. He was oh. a nice guy when I met him. And uh, he. everybody says what a nice guy he was. Decent. So. Decent. We want decency. Exactly. All right. Other news. Well, In Alaska, the uh, state has settled a lawsuit against it. They admit they illegally denied uh, <laughs> annual oil wealth payments, which they make to the entire population, to same-sex spouses, defying a court order to do so. They So they've settled this suit. They're not giving anyone any money, but they, uh, they agree that they did wrong and they'll do differently in the future. Well, they settled with one guy, but they should be giving everybody back pay. They well, they didn't give him any money either. All right. Uh, okay. And well, good news from Kansas, where the governor, Laura Kelly, um, is likely vetoing. She made a statement against the bill banning trans girls from sports. She says it's going to kill jobs. And uh, look, I, this is also, you know, she issued an executive order on sexual orientation and gender identity. She's a Democrat. And so that's encouraging. Well, I have a whole list of state actions, which I won't go through because we referred to them in, in our interview, but I'll tell you that in Maryland, the uh, legislature banned the uh, LGBTQ panic defense and waived requirement for publication of name changes. And the governor of Arizona has vetoed a bill that would require uh, parental opt-in to an LGBT and HIV curriculum, although he issued an executive order uh, mandating publication of the whole curricula to inform parents. Uh, but bad news from Oklahoma, Missouri, Florida, North Dakota, another Tennessee. North Dakota, Tennessee, uh, Texas, Awful. you know, bad stuff all over. Awful. Arkansas did another, another bad bill as well. Yeah. Uh, um, all right. Uh, men behaving badly. Oh, okay. Well, uh, you know, we told you about Scott Rudin as being the monster boss, and he's a big producer. Uh, this is mainly about being a bully. Uh, it's not about sexual harassment. He's a gay man. You know, he produced The Book of Mormon and many movies that you have seen. But actor Karen Olivo, uh, the star of Moulin Rouge, says, I'm not going back into the show because the industry is not standing up to Scott Rudin. He's not even producing her show. But she's so furious, they are having a march on Broadway on Thursday at one o'clock going from uh, you know, Columbus Circle to Broadway to, to demand that Scott Rudin fund 40 uh, 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 or, organi theater organizations for people of color. I mean, there are some serious demands here. They don't just want, oh, let him go away and that's gonna solve the problem. When Broadway actors are marching, we have reached some kind of critical mass. And then there's Andrew Cuomo, uh, the governor of New York, credibly accused of sexual harassment by seven women and by legions of people, also of bullying and inappropriateness. Big story in the Times Magazine, which includes him uh, referring to a man saying, you'd be a good looking tranny if you've got a good set of, and then he used a, a coarse word for female for breasts. Uh, and then also of bragging about how he was excellent at oral sex in a, in a meeting. Now, his spokesperson denies this and says he's the most pro-transgender governor history, but this is very typical of him. Well, it's typical of a lot of men, which is why we call this segment Men Behaving Badly. And then there's uh, Jerry Falwell Jr. in uh, Virginia. Liberty University, of which he was the president, is suing him for $10 million for breach of contract and withholding information about his uh, sexual activities and alcohol use and claiming he damaged the school's reputation. Yeah. Uh, I could argue with that, but. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> and better news, Kellogg's has launched with GLAAD, 
a Together with Pride cereal in heart-shaped rainbow colors coming Please. in May. Come all on. The, all the Kellogg's characters are on the box. T Tony the Tiger and Snap, Crackle, and Pop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can we get off the commercial? Well, uh, in Bloomington, Illinois, we have uh, a new candidate for the ministry in the United Methodist Church, Isaac Simmons, 23 years old, who performs uh, as a drag performer as Ms. Penny Cost, uh, Pentecost, get it? Uh, it it's, uh, Isaac is beginning a five-year process to become uh, an official minister. Uh, performs at a drag Sunday service at Hope United Methodist Church. Uh, next year, the General Conference of the Methodist Church is going to debate their split between the uh, progressive and conservative factions. Look forward to that in the fall of 2022. But meanwhile, Isaac is uh, going to become a minister. In Clyde, Texas, Trevor Wilkinson, we have a picture of him, a gay teen. He was suspended last year for wearing nail polish at school. And so he argued for a gender neutral dress code and won. His own principal said we would never change the policy, and he did. Uh, and uh, oh, uh, we are sad to report yet another uh, murder of a, a black uh, trans woman, Remy Fennell, in North Carolina uh, on the left there. The, on the right is Jada Peterson, who we told you about last week, I think. Uh, two men have now been arrested for killing Remy and Jada. Uh, they, it is believed by the police that uh, these guys were targeting uh, trans women. And they're, sex, they're sex workers, and they were uh, engaging them, bringing them to, to or meeting them at uh, Holiday Inns or whatever the motels were, and killing them. Uh, Remy was also a hairstylist, and so the police are hoping that this ends a wave of killings. The public is not so sure about that yet, but arrests uh, in these cases a good thing. Uh, and we're also uh, happy to see that New York City's uh, Unity Project has gotten together with the Alley Forney Center to uh, create a Unity Works jobs program for homeless LGBTQ youth. Uh, we two million bucks, we need more. In Appleton, yeah. Wisconsin, some guy posted an electronic sign with a lot of homophobic messages. So 150 people protested. Uh, uh, they were mostly witless slurs. And uh, so, you know, the community turned out not liking to see this stuff. Shall we move to international news? Yes. Well, uh, this is, you know, grassroots uh, energy and organizing really is uh, the theme of everything these days. In uh, Cameroon, not so good news, the authorities are escalating their abuse of LGBT people with threats, beatings, arrests, forced HIV tests, and anal exams. Uh, it's a really ugly report yeah. from Cameroon. There's a picture of two trans women, Shakiro and Patricia, being held in a, in a prison there. Uh, one arrestee was subjected to an anal exam. The penalty for sodomy there is up to five years. Um, they, you know, they, they raided an HIV service and arrested 13 people. Uh, they told trans women they were devils and not human. Uh, oh, well, just awful. Goes on. Uh, and uh, a little less violent, but uh, no nicer. In Namibia, we have a little update on uh, the gay couple who are trying to get their uh, twin girls born to a surrogate in South Africa back into Namibia. We see the twin girls on the right with one of the dads and their older child on the left with the other dad. Uh, uh, the High Court of Namibia has refused papers for these twin girls who, born in South Africa. Uh, on the right, you see the uh, Namibian citizen dad, uh, is that uh, uh, Philip, with the girls in South Africa, Guillermo, who is uh, a Mexican citizen, is pictured in Namibia on the left with their two-year-old son. Uh, the court is demanding proof of a genetic connection to Philip, the Namibian citizen. The dads are refusing any kind of 
uh, documentation like that. Straight couples don't have to prove that to uh, bring surrogate born children into the country. It's terrible. Better news from Germany. Criminal complaints have been filed versus five Chechen officials for crimes against humanity for their persecution, uh, a br brutal persecution of LGBTQ people, including murder. Uh, uh, so the European Center for Constitutional Rights and Constitutional and Human Rights filed this. And look, it means that if any of these Chechens go to Germany, they can be arrested. But it also, if the investigation into it may help in Europe with uh, LGBTQ Chechens seeking asylum. Oh, that would be good. In the UK, uh, Boris Johnson, Prime Minister, will not criminalize normal, non-coercive uh, prayer and religious conversion therapy. Well, he, we, don't, he we, said, don't care what, we don't care what religions do. Uh, we do, but I mean, we're talking about reimbursable therapy. That's when you're banning conversion therapy. You don't want it to be sponsored uh, by the government. Well, he uh, he had promised more, and people are not happy about his backing down. Uh, happier news from Peru, where a an out lesbian has been elected to the Congress there. There she is, showing off her strength. Uh, Susel Parade, Paradis. Yes. I'm guessing on that. She's married. She's a lawyer. Uh, and she promises to fight for uh, LGBTQ rights in Peru, which is a very conservative country and is currently conducting a presidential election between a uh, an anti-LGBT progressive and an anti-LGBT conservative. She wants a quota system to guarantee jobs for trans people and tougher penalties for hate crimes. Okay. You know, oh, so she got married in the United States herself. Uh, yes, that would make sense. In Australia, on Phillip Island near Melbourne, Mikey O'Halloran, uh, who moved there for greater freedom, uh, wanted to paint his home in rainbow colors. But he his, has rainbow hair. He, he's a hairstylist. And his uh, immediate neighbors got all upset and came and banged on his door and threatened him with violence. Uh, threatened to kill him. Yes, they did. Uh, but then uh, the rest of the island came to his defense and painted his house. Cut 100 to people painted the house. <laughs> I'm not sure that would be my choice for a house, but... Uh, he is now organizing the first Pride March for this town of 7,000 people. <laughs> you go, Mikey. Uh, okay, all right. AIDS news. Uh, President Biden is asking $670 million from the Congress to end the HIV AIDS crisis by 2030. That would be interesting. Uh, that's defined as reducing new infections by 90% to only 3,000 a year, which is higher than we would like it. But uh, they want to fund more PrEP, uh, the NIH, uh, other agencies uh, uh, to, you know, promote prevention, treatment, et cetera. And there are promising results on a new vaccine based on the same science as the COVID vaccines. And that would really go a long, long way to- Dr. Um, Presses and Northrop says the it is a promising treatment. Well, I've been waiting about 30 years for that. So uh, it's nice to be able to say it new technology yeah well it's the first time any of it has made sense uh the vaccines they promised before did not make sense this one does all right uh entertainment news well we told you about the bachelor star colton underwood uh coming out last week he is now in the middle of filming a docu series on netflix about accepting his sexuality with olympian gus kenworthy there on the right colton is in the center of the photo, Colt, uh, Gus will be acting as a guide to him. But there's an online petition with, oh, I guess it's, I have 10,000, it's probably 20,000 signatures, calling on Netflix to cancel it due to Colton stalking his bachelor pick, Cassie Randolph. Yeah, people are losing their minds over this, evidently. <laughs> Not me, but... Uh, uh, well, he, I, well, the story is that he stalked her, he harassed her, uh, and it it's very strange. He, he, he forgives him. She forgives him. 
Well, fine, uh, because she doesn't have to have anything to do with him anymore. But why was he doing that in the first place? Uh, you know, this guy was evidently quite tortured by his identity issues. And so he takes it out on her by stalking and harassing her. Right. And uh, she forgives him. Fine. Great. We're uh, all happy for that. But come on. So people do not want him valorized uh, with this Netflix series. And, you know, he goes through all this. He's mean to her. And and now he gets a Netflix series and he gets a guide to uh, an Olympian to help him come out. It's all the celebrity culture. And there are a lot of comments online by people saying, gee, when I came out, uh, my parents threw me out of the house. Or when I came out, you know, I, I lost my job. And this guy gets a Netflix series. So uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, unhappiness about uh, uh, Colton. All right. Lil Nas X has launched a satanic T-shirt line. He's a marketing genius. I want that. I want the, the T-shirt. Formidable foe of the fundamentalists. The more they attack him, the more he just lets them have it. He just did a little uh, online interview with kids asking him questions about uh, the difficulties coming out and uh, had a great time with them. Send me the link. I'll share it with our viewers. No, uh, I'll try to dig it up. Uh, I get uh, Tiger King, you know, after the hit series is now being made into a, a two made for TV movies, I think one for NBC with John Cameron Mitchell as the Tiger King. That's going to be a little strange. And Kate McKinnon as uh, Carol Baskin, uh, who was well, in prison for hiring a hitman to kill Carol. Exactly. And uh, Amazon's making a version with Nicolas Cage as the Tiger King, which is a little more typecasting. John uh, Mitchell, Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Well, he can do anything, John Cameron Mitchell. Uh, this next week on the 28th, uh, there's going to be an online uh, production of a famous old play called Jerker uh, that's about phone sex, sort of, except deeper than that. Uh, if you look at outfronttheater.org uh, in Atlanta, you can find out about that. And I'm feeling a little trepidation about the upcoming Pride series on uh, FX May 14th and 21st because uh, I'm in it and that always makes me nervous. But you may be in it, too, because their cameras followed us around. Remember, they came to the yes. show. And they had a long walk. Watch out for that. Pride on FX. And it's six hours, then they're going to show three hours the first night and three hours a week later, which always makes me think they're just dumping this series on uh, the public without much fanfare, although they are running promos for it. And it's not gay, but Josh O'Connor is going to be in Romeo and Juliet on PBS this Friday at uh, uh, the evening. Check your local listings. The Why app. do I care? What do you care? Well, he only had a big gay role and he's going to play another big gay role. And uh, he just, just now he's doing this. Just All people. right. Well, uh, thank you to Nadine and Shannon. Thank you, Andy. We'll be back next week. Thank you for watching. Bye bye.